Uh, okay, so the topic for today, as I said, is um, digital diplomacy and the future of multilateral environmental negotiations. And for that, it is my great pleasure to welcome my colleague in the research platform, Governance of Digital, digital Practices, Alice Vadro. Alice is an associate professor for international relations with a focus on environmental politics at the Department of Political Science here in Vienna. Uh, she's also a visiting research fellow at the Center for Science and Policy at the University of Cambridge. Uh, and uh, importantly, she's also the principal investigator in an ERC starting ground project that's called Maripol Data, that has a very nice website as well, which you can check out, and a, a Twitter presence and, and so on. And it, it's, a, it's a team she's um, pulled together and that works on issues of biodiversity, ocean governments, international environmental politics. Um, Alice is also a member of the Young Academy of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, and she is a senior fellow with the Earth System Governance Platform. As an introduction, I would like to start with two pictures. So these two pictures um, are pictures that show negotiations that I observed in 2018 in Sharm el Sheikh during the conference of the parties of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And this is very similar to negotiations that you know in the context of climate negotiations, the big summits and conferences where states come together. This is, um, both pictures were taken in the negotiation room. But negotiations can also mean something different. They can also be outside of the negotiation room. On the left side, you see informal consultations on a specific article at COP25 of the UNFCCC, so the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in Madrid. And on the right side, you see another, let's say, informal space outside of the negotiation on the streets, um, representatives of Fridays for Future and other um, NGOs and activism groups um, protesting outside of the negotiation building. So these are the typical pictures that we know when we think about environmental negotiations or global environmental meetings. And these are the starting points of my lecture. These sites where negotiation takes place are important entry points to study um, contemporary dynamics and global environmental politics. There are central sites of political action, contestation and order making, diverse actors such as mentioned state actors, but also representatives of NGOs and activism groups come together for a predefined period in the framework of a meticulously, meticulously orchestrated meeting that is structured by diplomatic practice, diplomatic protocols and procedures. Actors at this meeting, they seek to influence our responses to the global environmental crisis. Um, these sites offer the opportunity for observation, analysis, and critique by scholars such as myself and my team. We are observing negotiations leading to a new treaty to protect marine biodiversity. But there is one question that also um, challenged our work in the past two years. And this question is, what happens when multilateral negotiations are forced to go online? So especially during COVID-19, um, negotiations could not take place as usual. What happened? Could diplomats use online tools to actually, um, let's say, continue multilateral dialogue? If yes, how is that possible? How could they do it? And how does it relate to scholarly work on digital diplomacy predating the COVID-19 crisis? Another starting point is the work I did so far on multilateral environmental negotiations. These are a few publications. Uh, and here you can see my work is basically ethnographic work. So I'm sitting in these negotiation rooms, observing how actors contest global order, how they influence treaty making and so on. But again, this is also a challenge for us as researchers. If negotiations go online, how can we study those sites? Yeah. So these are two pictures that show or that give you like an impression on what it looked like first to go online in terms of multilateral negotiations. This is a picture taken from the 75th annual UN General Assembly. You see President um, of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, who's speaking here on a screen. Um, only a few people are in the room wearing masks. 
And on the right side, you see this is in my, my office. Um, we do digital ethnography. This is my student observing some of those meetings. And these will be some of the issues I will be talking today. Um, this is an overview of my talk. First, I will introduce you to uh, the, what environmental diplomacy is, why the sites of environmental diplomacy matter and how they work. I think this is really important in order to understand the challenges, but also the opportunities um, that emerge with digital diplomatic tools. So I will then talk about digital diplomacy as understood in the literature before the COVID-19 crisis. It's important to make this distinction because so far um, there hasn't been any intellectual thinking about how to negotiate online. Negotiations are inherently um, physical and there are specific reasons that I will outline in this first part of the lecture. Then the third part will be on digital multilateralism. I will introduce two cases from my ongoing research that will also demonstrate why it is so difficult to negotiate online. Then um, introduce the method of digital ethnography that, also, that may be interesting actually also for, for some of your work. And uh, finally, um, discuss these um, issues and problematize online futures of digital multilateralism. Okay, so why do the sites of global environmental negotiations matter? What's the value of these kinds of negotiations, especially in light of the critique that governments are moving forward in a very slow pace to combat climate change, for instance, or halt the loss of biodiversity? So the value of environmental negotiations and summits is that they are um, portraying or providing an opportunity for universal multilateralism. So all UN member states and non-state state actors can take part in this meeting. This is not true for all summits. For instance, the G8 or G20 is limited to a few states. But in general, if you think about the big climate conferences or other biodiversity negotiations, all UN members take part and non-state actors as well. It's called participation and diplomacy at the highest political level. And there is some kind of urgency attached to this meeting. It's a political imperative to, in a sense, break through a, a diplomatic impasse. The final stage of negotiation always involves um, head of states. Um, recently, this turned around. So since COP21, they start with the head of states and then they go on with the negotiations. And the aim is to resolve issues that could not be resolved by negotiations during multilateral negotiation. Technically, conferences become summits um, where head of states take over the process. So these are a few examples. Um, and here you can also see a few pictures showing here, for instance, former US President Barack Obama entering the center and here the Swedish prime minister and pre former French um, President Nicolas Sarkozy, German Chancellor Angela Merkel. So they enter the room. There is a lot of summit drama attached to these big meetings. So what happens at these meetings? What, why are these sites so important? They are important because um, they result in the negotiation of multilateral environmental agreements, MEAs, um, and because they make legal order. So at the left side, you see a screenshot of a, of a text and how they look like. Um, this is a revised draft of a specific agreement. So during these negotiations, states come together to produce these kinds of texts. They negotiate language of new treaties or of uh, multilateral environmental agreements. And they review and advance the implementation of MEAs by further developing text at periodic meetings. MEAs um, focus on environmental issues. They create binding international law. And they include, as I mentioned earlier, multiple parties. Um, MEAs can also adapt to changing circumstances. So for instance, by negotiating decisions or amendments to adjust the contents of an MEA, or by negotiating a new independent agreement that can extend the scope or reach of the current agreement. So um, the Kyoto Protocol, uh, for instance, is an example on how the climate convention um, was um, yeah, adapted in a way. There are some key principles of multilateralism. And it's important to keep these principles in mind when we think about the possibilities to move negotiations online. 
So multilateral negotiations are defined as the process of simultaneous negotiation by three or more parties over one or more issues that aims at an agreement acceptable to all parties. Yeah. Um, Winham from 1977 has argued that multilateral negotiations imply making some kind of order by those participating in a process where multiple parties, issues, and roles interact for a predetermined period in a highly structured and restrained setting. Um, there are some criteria that were developed to define what multilateralism is and what these meetings are. And they are defined by the fact that there are multiple parties, multiple issues, multiple roles and participants. As you can see here on the picture, this is a picture that shows the participants from the Global Youth Biodiversity Network attending a conference of the parties. So you really have diverse groups participating in this meeting, trying to shape the outcome. Um, and it's especially the the physical spaces that matter if you want to understand some of these dynamics that um, shape treaty making, and especially also the consensus making, which is the decision making rule that um, determines multilateralism. Another important criteria is the criteria of orchestration. So you can see this is um, the negotiation room of COP25 of, COP of the UNFCCC. And um, in order to orchestrate the different positions of member states to the convention, the different statements that are made, but also the interventions by non-state actors, you have to have some kind of orchestrator to deal with this complexity. And um, you have to have some kind of practices, practices that are different from bilateral negotiations. So um, the nature of multilateral negotiations as a simultaneous process involves, involving three or more parties implies this kind of need to orchestrate the process. And this role is often played by either elected president, chairs or facilitators, they are often sitting here in the front, or it's supported by the treaty secretariat and other staff of the United Nations, including services such as translation and transcript writers. So when we talk about the digital side, just imagine what such an orchestrator could be at the digital side. It's not easy to imagine. It's actually more difficult to implement. Another principle is um, the fact that multilateral decision making is based on consensus. And attainment of consensus means um, up that abstention is an affirmative rather than a negative vote. So reaching a compromise that will be reasonable and acceptable to all is the goal. An agreement will generally, and in order to attract consensus, be expressed in more general or constructively ambiguous terms. There is rarely veto in these kinds of multilateral negotiations, and parties tend to disagree with the proposed treaty or a section thereof, um, rather by abstaining um, without blocking the outcome. There is some pressure in the room to accept consensus language which is um, often so high that parties may agree to the text um, late in the evening, so at the 11th hour, so as not to be blamed for the failure of the negotiations. And this um, has a negative consequence because it leads to agreement without peace and um, yeah, the fact that often governments tend to agree on the lowest, the lowest common denominator in, um, yeah, in, um, at the expense of really progressive environmental meetings. So this implies that there is some kind of international socio-political pressure that leads to the conclusion of treaties and consensus rather than a legal obligation to conform in the negotiation room. This is a picture showing um, a president of negotiations um, in the United Nations headquarters and with the hammer she's closing the negotiations. So these kind of retruers uh, and symbols are very important in the negotiation space. They are understood by all diplomats and actors attending the room because they are part of diplomatic practice and protocol. So one um, and other important aspect of negotiations and the sites thereof are negotiations behind closed doors. And these are pictures um, that I took from the UNFCCC COP15 in 2009. Um, so here you see the 
Chancellor, German former Chancellor Angela Merkel in a bilateral talk with Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd. So um, here another meeting showing heads of state negotiating behind closed doors. So here Barack Obama, this was actually in Copenhagen where some states, um, including the US and China, were able to push a specific agreement through. So what I told you now were some kind of characteristics of this meeting, why they are important and why it's also um, important to consider the effects that the physical sites can have on agreement making. But it's quite important also to look at summit not in terms just as neutral spaces or technical institutions that are designed to facilitate cooperation between existing parties, but to have a more critical view on them. And there are some scholars using post-structuralist perspectives on summit and diplomacy, highlighting the performative dimension of these negotiations. And according to them, diplomacy needs to be viewed as intersubjective and constitutive in the sense that the diplomatic process takes place between two constructive subjects whose very construction relies on the intercourse and mutual recognition of diplomacy, really understood as diplomacy taking place on site. So this perspective rejects the distinction between real politics and illusionary rituals, but views multilateral diplomacy in a term of, as a spectacle, a performance um, with real political effects um, and all real politics. So instead of viewing, for instance, what I showed you earlier, these kind of meetings and the showing up as purely performative, they argue that these performances have political effect and are indeed real politics. Because they form social interaction involving a degree of performance, identity construction, and play acting. Um, in relation to this view, um, there has been an interesting um, text by Carl Des arguing that summits have stages, scripts, cast, and audiences. The audience is being important because the audiences push actors to negotiate in a specific direction or put some kind of um, obligation um, to come up with an agreement. So audiences play a very specific role, even though they are not real audiences, but audiences um, constructed through the idea that these are um, sites embedded um, within international um, public attention. And media has also a specific important role in this regard. So um, the fictions and the dramas of diplomacy, um, as Constantino argued already in the 90s, never end. And they become the world of diplomacy. They are what there is. They are fundamentally political. So their existence constitutes, brings to life, makes real the identities and subjectivity of the parties who participate in them. Um, as I just argued, or as I just showed, these sites have been seen in relation to um, notions such as theater, drama, and symbolic politics. They are an integral part of the politics of simulation by means of which late modern societies manage to sustain, at least for the time being, what is known to be unsustainable. Yeah? And this has also become, been, been called show politics. So to demonstrate that the political class are still offering alternative visions, that electorates are still making a choice between these visions and that political institutions are still capable of implementing their decisions. Um, but this implies to a certain extent that um, there are limitations regarding uh, what assumptions elected leaders um, are in charge and can in a few days of negotiations with other leaders at the summit solve in the end. So um, scholars have argued that it's not a problem of political will, but that contemporary power relations are much more dispersed um, and hybrid, making it very difficult at these meetings to come up with um, progressive agreements. Um, there is a very interesting perspective on these sites and why they are still spaces for radical diplomacy and this is to look specifically at the spaces for protest and dissent that these sites provide. So such spaces can be incredibly valuable to social movements, activists, and protestators seeking visible innovative forms of action. 
who have been able to hijack mega events to stage their own festivals of resistance. So the counter summit, as this is often called, is able to exploit the window of visibility that is offered by these big negotiations um, and to provide space to um, speak out and demonstrate alternative visions. So according to this perspective, um, this offers the opportunity to reinvent democracy. So um, a reinvention of society such that the mode of economic production, the structures of political governance, the dissemination of scientific innovation, the organization of the media, social relations, and the relationships between society and nature are subjected to a radical, participatory, and living dip dip uh, dip democratic process. Um, I have talked a lot about the sites. Um, I have talked about um, what they are constituted of, about post-structuralist perspectives, but here you can see how such sites actually look like. And this is uh, one example. It's the example of the UNFCCC COP that took place in Bonn. And you can see that the sites are divided into different zones with different um, access conditions. So depending on the badge that you have as an actor, a government actor, a non-state actor, you can access different parts of the venue um, where different things take place. So in some parts, you will have the formal negotiations, other parts are um, open to the public. Um, and this division also of access rights takes part in the performance that these meetings have and the possibilities also for specific actors to shape the negotiations and to influence the making of the text. Um, scholars from geography have interpreted this kind of um, materiality of the sites um, and argued that the conferences create new material geographies. So, in, for instance, in the form of new or strengthened international borders or urban transformations. So, hosting a large scale conference often produces temporary and permanent changes in host cities. Conference tourism that often accompanies participation in these meetings. There are several uh, trips offered to specific yeah, sites and um, places outside of the conference venue. They lead to big business, the construction of hotel, recreation, etc. cetera. Um, so conferences are often part of city marketing campaigns and civic boosterism. And these can last short, a uh, short period of time or they can have longer lasting um, effects for example, restrictions placed on local residents and guests because of security, for instance. And during these meetings, surveillance, police and military presence uh, increases and the city can become securitized. Yeah. So this is um, a picture from COP21 in, in Paris. There was even more uh, police on site. I attended this COP because of the um, attack at the Bataclan that was just happening 10 days, I think, before the COP. So the presence of security staff is, is a big deal. And it also it may also influence how you behave on the site. Um, the conference sites for negotiating con um, consensus have effects of performance of legitimacy as well. So conferences, they provide a visible stage on which delegates can perform their legitimacy through taking part in the negotiations. Um, they take part in the construction of expert identities, um, actors, individuals perform identities and concern at a global audience through the media. This is what I mentioned earlier. So you can see here, this is a press conference. Um, it's um, the European, the delegation of the European Union that speaks um, in front of representatives of the media. Um, and these media uh, events during conferences of the parties and media narratives, they produce specific particular visions of the conference, often sensationalizing, commonly reflecting hegemonic political concerns and frequently excluding uh, alternative understandings. But these audiences are an important part um, of such mega events. And this is what I said um, at the beginning. Um, it's not just the formal negotiation site, it's the whole city that becomes somehow part of the event. Um, so 
Dissents and protests takes place outside of the negotiation room, either by delegates forming counter alliances or by activists outside of the formal conference program. So you have walks out demonstrations, police brutality, cordons and kettling and terrorism. And conferences, they, they still do provide the opportunity for high profile protests, specific ways in which process is shut down and circumscribed. Okay, so now I have tried to um, introduce you to what multilateral environmental negotiations are, why the physical sites are so important and how scholarship has tried to interpret these sites in terms of performance, but also um, by looking at um, how the interaction between people takes place in identity construction um, and how important this relationship between the global audience and those that negotiate on site actually is. Um, what does this have to do with digital diplomacy? Um, digital diplomacy is a term that emerged um, in the past years to capture specific phenomena. And at first sight, they have little to do with the sites that I just presented. So there is one reason for this, and it's because diplomacy is hard to change. So uh, practice scholars that are inter or have been interested in, um, in diplomacy or diplomatic practice argue that um, new configurations of actors, new information technologies, and new political functions are transforming diplomacy, but in ways that prolong established ways of doing things, and very slowly. So change occurs incrementally, and diplomacy may transform over time, but only at the margins and evolutionary. Paul Sharp, who wrote a very... Um, interesting introduction into diplomatic practice has noted that diplomats tend to act as defenders and beneficiaries of the present international arrangements, which imply some resistance to change. So um, this is a very nice quote I found in a text by Cohen. Diplomacy is an old fashioned tradition coexisting with far reaching innovation. And if we consider um, this perspective on diplomatic practice, it's quite difficult to think about how the digital space, how digital infrastructures um, shaped this kind of um, political sphere. However, the expansion in the number and variety of international actors empowered by ICT and social media um, is certainly something that needs to be considered. So on site, you will see that many actors um, use social media to um, make their positions not only in the negotiation room, but also to the outside audience. Um, and social media and ICT allow more and more actors to, to attend these negotiations, and they attract more and more actors that um, are amorphous civil society groups, such as, for instance, Friday for Future. Um, these are all changes in diplomatic practice that um, we have seen in the past uh, decade. And they also, they do not only include ICTs and social media, but also the development of new international security and agendas, a focus on climate change and pandemic diseases. Um, and what I'm just um, presenting is from a text by Hocking et al from 2012 on how diplomacy has been affected inter alia by ICT and social media and digitalization. And already in 2012, they argued that climate change and pandemic diseases um, will become key diplomatic issues in international security. Um, I will not go through all of these um, changes in diplomatic practice, but pointing to the very important observation that digital technology has to some extent shaped um, diplomatic practice. Um, and there is one reason for this, and this is the pressure that was put on diplomats and the need to develop digital diplomatic tools. So in a sense, diplomats have always been quite um, responsive to specific new technologies. So maybe the telegraph, typewriter, or telephone, they all um, have been somehow part of shaping the diplomatic milieu and have introduced shift in policy agendas and global power equations. But over the last decade, 
um, the growth of digital communication, social media, and mobile communication devices really posed a challenge to diplomats that several scholars such as Hocking, um, who, who, has observed, who, who, who has observed these challenges, um, argues in responding to the terms and adapting the, presses, uh, the practice as well as organizational capacity. Nevertheless, diplomats in foreign ministries, as Hocking and Al argue, and multilateral organizations seem to recognize that something significant is occurring here, even if they are not quite sure of its dimensions or how they should handle it. So that was in 2012. Um, and since then, several scholars have tried to somehow you know, capture the effects of digital technology on diplomacy. So there are a series of recent, recent studies that have indicated that diplomatic practice has already somehow intermingled with digital tools and instruments. And scholars increasingly study the effects of um, ICTs on diplomacy to capture how digital tools affect. And here I refer to the central definition of diplomacy as the principles means by which states communicate with each other, enabling them to have regular and complex relations. And so in the past decade, there are considerable, there is a considerable number of terms and definitions uh, that were developed and used in the broader literature to describe uh, diplomacy with the help of ICTs. And um, we did a search of, of such terms and um, compared some of the definitions. And you can see there are numerous ones, such as e-diplomacy, virtual diplomacy, digital diplomacy, online public diplomacy, digital public diplomacy, net diplomacy, diplomacy 2.0. Zero, internet diplomacy, social media-based diplomacy, social media-based public diplomacy, and internet public diplomacy. And these different terms all somehow try to capture similar phenomenon. Um, so for instance, some terms such as e-diplomacy, virtual diplomacy, and digital diplomacy are used very broadly and interchangeably to describe um, what Holmes defines as a strategy of managing change through digital tools and virtual collabor collaborations. E-diplomacy, for instance, is defined as the use of web and new ICT to help carry out diplomatic objectives. Virtual diplomacy is defined as diplomacy conducted in the networked globe or uh, with the aid of ICTs. Digital diplomacy is defined as diplomacy practice through information-rich, highly interactive environments. So these definitions suggest that digital tools do not transform diplomat diplomacy per se, but are used to somewhat perform specific tasks with the assistance of ICTs. Um, and another part of the literature emphasizes the effects of social media on diplomacy in the broadest sense, but also on global environmental negotiations. So these terms, these set of terms, they add a different layer to diplomacy in so far as specific actors such as embassies, diplomats, foreign ministries or intergovernmental bodies and secretariat establish digital representations and identities that allow them to directly interact with citizens and share information via social media. So these direct interaction with citizens is something that one could argue has changed since the introduction and increased use of social media in the diplomatic realm. So some of these terms include diplomacy, Twitter diplomacy, hashtag diplomacy, Twitter public diplomacy, Facebook diplomacy, and or YouTube diplomacy. Um, phenomena such as diplomacy or Twitter diplomacy have um, accelerated um, the communication between, let's say, on the one side, uh, embassies, diplomats, ministries, and so on, and the citizens, but also the communication between them, and also increase the immediacy associated with the increased use of ICTs. Great. And these Thank are you. just a few examples. So you can say the, you can see the Austrian embassy um, tweeting uh, tourism related issues, making some kind of, um, um, yeah, advertises for staying in, um, in Austria for, for your travels. But this is another example, um, the Austrian government retweeting the French government 
with information on um, a lockdown uh, after eight o'clock. That was, um, yeah, during the COVID-19 crisis in January 2021. This is another tweet where you can see uh, the, the, the ambassador actually um, talking or giving a talk and reaching out to citizens. So these kind of interactions, one could say, are specifically new about digital diplomacy in the broadest sense. So what are some of the implications for diplomatic practice? So as I said earlier, and especially if you look at these issues from the lens of practice theories, um, assuming that practices are um, patterns uh, of repeated behavior, then you can say that, um, yes, there are new configurations of actors, new information technologies, and new political functions that are transforming diplomacy, but in ways that prolong established ways of doing things. Change occurs incrementally, as I argued, and diplomacy may transform over time, but only at the margins and evolutionary. Um, still, and I have said that earlier, diplomacy um, has, or ICTs have changed diplomatic practice. Um, and again, this phrase, this phrase that I really like, uh, diplomacy as an old fashioned tradition coexisting with far reaching innovation. Um, what are now some implications of the scholarships for multilateralism and negotiations? So one could argue that diplomacy can somehow or does adjust to digitalization, such as adaptation um, by using, for instance, Twitter by diplomats uh, shows. However, this kind of adaptation is especially difficult in multilateral diplomacy and negotiation contexts. So the question is, can negotiations actually go online? Um, what are some implications of online tools or digital diplomacy in the multilateral context for reaching consensus or for protesting, um, for inclusiveness, and for um, the kind of um, struggle that we see in the negotiation room that is also part, one could say, of the game, the theater, the drama. Is it possible to have all this online? So. I will just show two cases um, that demonstrate how two different or how one specific negotiation had to go online during the COVID-19 crisis. And these two examples are linked to my ongoing work on a new treaty um, establishing an agreement for the protection and sustainable use of marine biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. So these are treaty negotiations, meaning that um, governments come together in the headquarters of the United Nations in New York for four negotiation rounds during two weeks um, to negotiate a new treaty text. And they had already negotiated three sessions, so over six weeks and had developed some kind of a draft treaty text. Before concluding this treaty, they needed a final negotiation round that was postponed in March 2020 because of COVID-19. And um, the postponement of this meeting um, was a big issue because it was really the final negotiation round and governments had expected to conclude the treaty during that meeting and were afraid that um, they could lose momentum and that um, especially critical governments would not continue to be engaged in this process. And in order to keep momentum and to keep the engagement of governments going, there were two different online initiatives that were set up, that were set up and that were discussed in terms of could these actually replace negotiations, yes or no? And the first one was the informal intercessional high seas treaty dialogue. So this was a process with more than 200 state and non-state actors um, that engaged 
in an online meeting using the infrastructure WebEx. And then the second one being the virtual intersessional work of the intergovernmental conference, which was launched by the president of the negotiations to facilitate written exchange of positions among more than 1,000 registered delegates over the tool MS Teams. And you can see here a screenshot from the informal intersessional high seas treaty dialogues. <clears throat> so you can see here the different state representatives. Some of them, as you can see here, you see Singapore and then Rina. So they put first like their state and then their name. There were different uh, conventions on how to do this. But in general, this looks like any other um, web conference um, that, that we are all now familiar with in the context of our daily work. However, in the context um, of these international inter intersessional treaty dialogues that I observed as um, a digital ethnographer, this is um, quite different because there is a speaking order, there is a diplomatic protocol, um, non-state actors are allowed to talk only after state actors talk, and access is restricted. So what we see in this example is that although these are not formal negotiations, but only an informal place for exchange, the kind of interaction and the way that governments discuss treaty texts um, is very similar to what we see in the negotiation room. However, and this has been highlighted by several countries that are against the use of online formats, especially China, for instance, but also Russia. They argue that security um, is not um, permitted in these kind of online meetings and don't take part in them. Um, nevertheless, there have been discussions on whether to use these kind of settings to develop a new treaty text, which, however, has not taken place. The second example is the online intersessional work during COVID-19 of the same treaty negotiations using MS Teams. And this is a, a screenshot that I took when I did um, the ethnographic work at this meeting. So you can see that a specific issue is posted and then countries, they can make comments um, on the specific treaty texts. So this intersessional dialogue is, um, allows for multi and bilateral communication between two negotiation sessions and conferences, but still they fail to qualify as formal negotiations and stages in the treaty making process, raising concerns about their legitimacy and usefulness. So from a legal perspective, these um, ongoing digital dialogues among governments in a multilateral seat setting are informal intersessional discussions without legal accountability. Um, and this is especially problematic because they have now been doing these kind of online um, interactions for, um, yeah, for almost two years. Um, so what, what is the place of these forms of interaction within the formal negotiation process? So governments are supposed to meet in March 2022, so in, in three months in New York again, and to negotiate the treaty. Um, will this work count in any way? Can they use agreements that, um, yeah, agreements on specific parts of the text that they reached by meeting online during these meetings, yes or no? So these are all very relevant questions that are still not resolved. And this is why um, looking at these kind of multilateral um, digital infrastructures and practices are new avenues for research. So the, while the combined analysis of digital and non-digital practices proves to be an essential avenue for future research, previous studies can only be considered like a first step towards a profound understanding of emerging digital sites in the context of multilateral environmental negotiations. And this leads to many questions, such as how do digital and non-digital diplomatic practices relate to each other? What are the boundaries and material geographies of the digital site? What digital infrastructures are needed to support a process of simultaneous negotiation? What are the implications for participating and for ensuring inclusiveness um, at the site? And what are the conditions um, and implications um, for protests and dissent and the performative aspect of multilateral negotiations as I introduced them earlier.
Um, I will now introduce the tool of digital ethnography as one tool that you that we have used in the project to study multilateral negotiations online and a tool that was already used by scholars to study specific aspects of multilateral negotiations. So there is one study I would like to refer to. It's a study by Suizea and Zanotti, and they employed collaborative event ethnography, so CEE, to observe indigenous representation practices at COP21 of UNFCCC. And they included the digital life of the COP as part of their field site and performativity as a different analytical category. So this means while being on site and observing um, state and non-state actors at the negotiation site, they also looked, for instance, at uh, the life um, of the conference that took place in Twitter. And to study these digital practices, they built on the work of Coleman, who suggests that cultural identities, representations, and imaginaries are remade, subverted, communicated, and circulated in digital spaces. So um, the authors considered the digital life of the conference as an equally important site and extended their field teams to engage researchers at their home institutions by using digital and visual ethnography. So they collected all types of um, materials such as photos, audio files, field notes, films, and so on, um, which they call, and, and then they developed an archive of digital artifacts. However, and again, this is um, something that is quite important if we think about digital multilateralism, um, this is very close to what I discussed when I introduced digital diplomacy as a concept or as a term to capture the influence of ICTs and social media on diplomatic practice. And this is not comparable with studying, for instance, digital multilateralism, as I have just introduced. So digital ethnography, um, and these are some interesting references that you could also look up, is a way of doing ethnography that is part of and participates in a digital material sensory environment, rather than sim si uh, simply ethnography about the digital. Yeah? And data sources for digital ethnography can be many different things, such as online meeting videos, online cultures, digital cultures, and so on. Um, but one aspect that is difficult and problematic when doing this kind of research is to identify your digital field site. So um, what's the researcher's uh, interest in what specific site and what practices related to the site? What are the boundaries of a specific field site, the temporal and the spatial boundaries? Um, how do you get access? So um, access implies the ability to capture interactions or behavior of interest, but access can also be more complicated. So if you think about the two examples that I showed you earlier, the examples of the online intersessional work and the MS Teams work, both were restricted in access and access um, conditions were similar to the physical side. So only those actors state and non-state actors could attend the digital sites that were accredited and registered for the physical sites. Yeah. Um, then another aspect, visiting the field site in the digital realm should be experiential rather than physical. Yeah. Um, an issue that um, is also important that needs to be considered when doing digital ethnography is um, your position within the field. So that's what I meant by saying lurking or not lurking. So do you want to be visible for others or do you want to hide? It's easier to hide depending on the context. If we think back um, on the two examples that I gave you in the web-based conference, it was not easy to hide. I had to be there with my camera switched on and my name on it. Otherwise they would have uh, thrown me out of the meeting um, with the MS Teams meeting with more than 1,000 participants and only those visible that type a statement, um, it's much easier to lurk as a digital ethnographer. And then obviously it's important to take field notes while doing the digital ethnography. Um, these are just some, some pictures showing how we did digital ethnography um, in my team. So we have a specific matrix. We watch the, the video together. So this is a collaborative event ethnography, but inspired or yeah, complemented with digital um, ethnographic tools. Um, here you can 
see again what I mentioned earlier. So you have the different state delegates. Um, and although they, one could say, mirror diplomatic practice, they employ diplomatic habitus in a very different ways. So some, this is the US representative, he has a very formal kind of interacting and others um, had their kids sitting next to them. So the pandemic, this is what we know from other meetings too. But in this case, it was very interesting to see that nevertheless, actors maintained the kind of diplomatic practice and rituals that we know from the negotiation room. This is just another screenshot um, that um, shows um, that was taken from the um, 15th conference of the parties of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And this meeting was hybrid. And here you can see different videos that were uploaded by different state actors taking part in this conference that we can also watch. So um, as I argued in a digital multilateral space, there are elements of traditional um, diplomacy. So you can see there are multiple roles, participants and issues. Access is restricted, so you need accreditation to the formal negotiation process. Um, there is some kind of security involved. So there are access rules. There is a need to disclose your identity. Um, there are virtual rules that get locked um, after all participants are in and after um, yeah, five minutes after the meeting started. Um, you can also observe formation of alliances and coalitions. So for instance, some actors speak on behalf of an actor group. Here the example of the G77 or the Caribbean and Latin American countries. Um, so in statements, um, also by using emoticons, as you could see from the MS teams, where states did not have to say, um, I um, agree with or um, um, I'm in line with this actor, they just could use emoticons. Then the speaking order is something that is very similar to the physical setting. So state actors speak first, um, non-state actors second, which is more difficult in MS Teams because there is no orchestrator. If you remember what I said at the beginning, multilateral negotiations need orchestrators. Um, there are no orchestrators that could be comparable to those that we find in the physical negotiation meeting. In video-based formats, there is diplomatic habitus that can be observed and what Sharp called acting with restraint. So not disclo dis dis disclosing too quickly your interest um, in the specific negotiation. Um, it's important to consider that although states have now used these kinds of tools in the past um, two years, um, there are no formal negotiations online in the strict sense. This means that um, there is no possibility to conclude a treaty online. There is the possibility to discuss specific aspects of the treaty text, but in the end, you need, um, if you remember the picture of the president with a little wooden hammer, smashing it down. So these examples highlight the problem that to be considered as a basis for a new treaty draft, current rules and procedures need to be adapted to create a legitimate basis for decision making through virtual interaction. So these constraint, constraints make it challenging to classify online dialogues as agreement making and consider their sites um, as, as research sites as well. Um, however, what we have seen in the past two years are also um, new emerging practices. So hybrid formats, for instance, in the context of the Convention on Biological Diversity, the 15th conference of the parties, they had an, a virtual session um, in October with um, Chinese uh, in China, with many people from Chinese ministries online uh, uh, on site. I'm sorry, on site, and others making their statements that were portrayed um, on videos and several online meetings and meetings that were hybrid. And um, another interesting case is the UNFCCC COP26 in Glasgow. So some meetings um, used also hybrid formats. And I know from colleagues that did research there, they were um, sitting in front of the negotiation room. They didn't get access to the room, but then they locked into the negotiation online. So they were on site, logging in online um, with people sitting in the room 
so these kind of hybrid uh, ways to negotiate on site, um, they are or might become more common in the future and really shape how global environmental meetings work. So this is an example from UNFCC COP26, as I mentioned. So this is um, one of the rooms. This is another room. You can see there are not that many people here. And here you can see that some people join um, on the screen. Okay, I have just two last slides before I end. So um, in these last two slides, I would like to problematize these online futures, especially because there is a lack of, of legitimacy of negotiating online. So um, legitimacy in the sense that um, there is a lack of agreement among states on the formal use of online negotiations to develop new treaty texts, to agree on new wording, or to make decisions on, online. And there is a challenge to um, mirror simultaneous interaction. So for the WebEx or video tools, there is a problem of inclusive, in inclusiveness. You have different time zones. You may have connection problems as I had today. Um, so really um, mirroring a situation with state and non-state actors in one room negotiating at the same time the same issues is um, a difficult situation to construct um, digitally. And with MS Teams, here it was possible to negotiate or to put your statements into um, the infrastructure 24 hours, seven days a week. But this did not ensure simultaneous interaction between actors. And the issue of orchestration that I mentioned earlier, so president, chairs, facilitators, cannot, they cannot give the floor to speakers or determine the speaking orders. And this also implies that they have a limited role in managing the dynamics of interaction and sometimes also in pushing for consensus if um, there are critical situations occurring. And then the last uh, point um, to think is um, the space for radical democracy that is not available in these kind of um, online settings or not yet available depending on the kind of infrastructures that may emerge in the future. So the sp spaces for protest and dissent by civil society, and as Carl Death argued, the spaces for that make um, or open the possibility for radical de democracy um, are not or cannot be constructed alongside the online meeting in the same way as they were um, on site during the big environmental conferences. So the pressure by the audience is reduced as and in relation to this also the fact that hiding or not participating um, is also invisible for others. So some states do not participate at all, not taking serious um, these new emerging forms of digital multilateralism. <laughs>